So I'm Dr. William Bowerman from the University of Maryland, and I'd like to welcome you to session five, Global Implications of the Guide. So we have two excellent panelists that will address this cross-cutting topic. While most sessions in this workshop are directly linked to the guide, you will not find a section labeled Global Implications of the Guide. While the guide is a US-centric document, its out use outside of the US has been evident over the more than 30 listening sessions and workshops the Standing Committee has held over nearly three years. Our workshop attendance these past two days illustrates both the keen interest as over 1,100 participants have registered, but also the breadth of participants from across the globe. As stated yesterday and illustrated at the last presentation, many different countries have either adopted the guide or have used the guide as a starting point and adapted to, to their laws and regulations, or in surveys, we have participants from across the world. Oh, could you go one back one slide, please? All right. Okay. All right, next slide. Um, one of the illustrations on the global implications of the guide um, deal with a workshop that was held in February of 2022. It was both in person and online with 1,785 registrants and many more views since representing 72 different countries that was dealing with animal welfare challenges and research and education on wildlife, non-model animal species, and biodiversity. These proceedings are available from the National Academies. One of the key points of this were that the taxa guidelines, which are produced by professional societies and utilized by many of our IACUCs, are used globally. So people look to the US for at least the starting point when they're looking at animal care and use across the globe. Next slide. In this session, our two speakers are looking at some guiding questions that they are provided. So if funding is coming from the US, but the activities occurring abroad, is there a requirement to follow the guide? Another question, how will ALEC use the guide internationally? How does ALAC view the articulation of the guide with regard to their other reference documents? And also when you are working in interna international locations and you need to consider different requirements, how do you mitigate your risk to be compliant in those spaces? And how do they align or don't align? So with that sh short introduction, I would like to move into our first presentation by Dr. Turner from University of Guelph, who will introduce herself. Great, thank you so much for um, setting up the stage for this session and for the kind invitation um, from the workshop organizers to speak today. Um, so can we go back? Yes, thank you. Um, so my name is Pat Turner, and as was mentioned, I'm affiliated with the University of Guelph as a university professor emerita, um, and in my day job, I'm corporate vice president global animal welfare for Charles River. Um, I do want to emphasize, uh, I was also a member of the committee that developed the eighth edition of the guide, um, and I want to emphasize that the opinions and um, content of my talk really are my own. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide, please. I think um, I think it's really important, of course, um, for all of us as participants um, at this workshop, you know, uh, are all very interested and passionate about the issues of, of animal welfare uh, as it pertains to working with animals in science and education. Um, but also it's important on, uh, for us to remember that the um, only way that we can work with these animals is through our social license. And um, I've just um, put up a, um, a, a slide here from um, a two, 2018 poll done by the Pew Research Center. Uh, this is based in the US demonstrating 
sort of diminishing support for um, use of animals in scientific research. And I could certainly have put up a similar one for, from Ipsos from 2018 in the UK that um, showed very similar results that only four out of 10 respondents find it acceptable to use animals for any research purpose. And this just emphasizes to us the importance of moving forward with this update of the guide, um, incorporating information um, that has come out in animal welfare science and other areas. As a community, we need to do more as it relates to caring for and work with animals and research to maintain this social license to be able to continue important work um, in science. So next slide, please. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today really um, is just to, again, emphasize that animal-based research is a global endeavor. This has been mentioned by a number of speakers um, yesterday already. Uh, I'll emphasize again that the guide provides a framework for expectations around international research um, involving animal care and use. I'll provide a couple of just brief examples of how the guide is used internationally and indicate um, an example of a problem that can occur when there's a guidance gap internationally in research animal care and management. And then I was also asked to um, provide examples maybe from other jurisdictions of approaches that might be borrowed to improve um, aspects of the guide as well as some um, trends in international topics in lab animal science um, that also could be considered for inclusion in the future guide. Um, so next slide, please. I think again, uh, everybody on this workshop is very much aware that animal research is a global endeavor, and this is really important. Um, this is um, a graph just indicating research and development as a percentage of GDP for various countries around the world. The y-axis um, indicates the number of researchers per million in population. And you can see, of course, the um, very important role that the U.S. has um, in, uh, you know, animal-based research and science and, and also in the number of researchers that are being trained um, in the U.S. But you can also see uh, from this graph a very large number of other countries um, that are training researchers and that are, um, you know, also investing in research and development as well. Um, some of these countries without strong animal welfare legislation as it pertains to um, research animals. What this means also is that there's a really a fluid exchange of scientific ideas, graduate students, postdocs, and researchers across borders around the world. And what goes on elsewhere in labs outside of the U.S. profoundly impacts the science that is ongoing in the U.S. And to validate our assumptions of sharing ideas and accepting um, results of different studies and things going on elsewhere, it is essential that the care and work with animals um, from these other places is conducted in similar ways to that in the U.S. So um, this really helps to emphasize the importance of the guide, um, not only in the U.S., but um, outside the U.S. and around the world. Next slide, please. I think something also that is important to remember is that the U.S. National Institutes of Health is the single largest public funder of biomedical research in the world. And this, again, emphasizes the need, um, you know, for having this um, international guidance um, for how animals are cared for and work with in science. And I, I just took a quick um, screen grab here from um, the NIH uh, awards by location and organization for 2024. This is just a partial listing and you, you can explore this on your own. But um, to date, even uh, where we are in 2024, there's over $51 million being provided to um, at least 83 foreign recipients in many countries um, around the world. So um, these are collaborators with U.S. Um, primary investigators, but also many of these are also um, primary investigators. And um, a condition of NIH funding outside of the U.S. is um, compliance with aspects of PHS policy. And there are others who are better um, uh, able to speak to some of these needs, but this includes um, being able to demonstrate 
um, compliance with uh, the guide as well in terms of how those institutions operate and manage and care for animals. So again, this is a condition of receiving um, US government funding for research, but there's a lot of this going on. And this also, this, this broad amount of research that's going on in many countries around the world also emphasizes the need to be flexible and to use performance standards so that these different facilities around the world are able to adapt and adopt them. Next slide, please. Um, so the international collaborations in science, um, next slide please. International collaborations in science, these are increasing. Um, just from the most recent figures I could find from 2006 to 2016, the number of publications that are authored by multiple international institutional contributors, they increased from almost 17% to almost 22% in that decade. So certainly have increased since that time. And it's a good thing. Multiple international institutional collaborators tend to be associated with higher impact papers and also with core centers of excellence. We can't um, fund excellence at every facility in every possible area of science. So having these international collaborations in place increases the impact and the quality of what we do. And again, I just wanna emphasize that then harmonizing these inter international interactions um, it means that there's a clear scientific imperative for ethical reasons, but also for reproducibility of results and statistical validity. We want to know that across all of these different sites and places, we are generally working with and caring for animals in similar ways so that we can then uh, rely on, on the quality and the data um, that is produced from there. Next slide, please. So the guide, um, provides this framework for international expectations for animal care and use. And it is required, as I mentioned, um, as a condition of receiving US government funding for research outside the US. As was mentioned yesterday, the guide has been translated into at least eight languages officially, um, a number of other languages unofficially as well. And um, part of why it works so well is, again, it's a guidance document, it doesn't have um, a it was not originally intended at least to be a regulatory document. And this very strong emphasis on performance-based standards and flexibility that so many um, speakers in this workshop have recommended and have talked about, these are key reasons why it is so successful and why it has been um, able to be adapted and adopted in many different countries around the world. And I want to give, um, next slide please, I want to give just an example of this from um, my own work within Charles River, um, that just by way of example, and I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see all these little blue dots on the map on the right side of the world, but um, the world map there, but there are um, over 100 sites, Charles River has over 100 sites in 21 countries with greater than nine languages and dialects spoken um, in all of these different um, locations. And there is no single set of regulations and legislation that um, we can use to kind of pull together our programs. But using um, this document that has performance standards like the guide, that can help us with this consistent framework. Um, and it's very important internally for us for our programs and policies, but it's also very important externally to public investors, regulatory authorities, and clients. Um, and this, again, performance-based approach and flexibility are really key to harmonization across sites and countries. And so we've been able to use the guide, again, to help pull together programs in all these different countries. Next slide, please. So just um, a couple of quick examples of how the guide has been adapted and adopted into um, uh, regulations and guidance in different countries. Um, the guide um, has been used as the basis for requirements in a number of countries. It's been embellished and added to, of course. One example that um, came to mind for me quickly was in Singapore with their NACLAR guidelines. Um, again, um, uh, reliant on many of the concepts and organization that um, came through in the guide. Next slide, please. Another um, important example 
um, in Brazil, legislation for animals and research in Brazil, again, mm -hmm. was strongly based around um, the guide and its organization again. And um, this, this was seminal for um, introducing national legislation for uh, research animal care uh, in that country. Next slide, please. As has been mentioned though by several people, um, it has been um, almost 14 years um, since you know, people have been actively working on content in the guide. And there are now that um, some of the concepts in the guide have fallen behind and we know that there are gaps. And um, this, this, um, this has then led to um, other guidance coming forward from other groups. And Dr. Burns mentioned this yesterday, but the Marseille Declaration um, was a document that came out of um, the Falasa 2022 meeting in Marseille. And um, this was a product of um, a group of pharmaceutical companies coming together, um, concerned, of course, about welfare standards that were um, being used within their own facilities, but also um, from um, facilities where animals may be bred for research and contract research organizations and others. And, um, you know, they came together to try to promote implementation of specific standards for animals housed and used internally um, and using um, largely UK Home Office and EU Directive as the basis for this. And of course, the motivations for this are, are highly admirable. But there is a question then, again, for, um, you know, companies and institutions that are conducting work for um, these uh, specific companies of whose standards should apply. So for example, um, the Canadian Council on Animal Care's RAP guidelines exceed those required um, in the UK Home Office and in, in EU Directive. So, you know, which standards then need to apply for um, Canadian facilities, for example, conducting work for these companies? And how does this work in a, a GLP, good laboratory practice facility that works with a hundred or more clients from around the world? Um, you know, these aren't necessarily reviewed or science-based, and this can lead to a piecemeal approach um, to developing programs. So again, just emphasizing really the importance of the guide in international work and how important it is that an update um, be done as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted now to move into um, a few ideas that perhaps could be borrowed, you know, as, as um, um, the committee uh, that will be updating the guide is starting to think about, you know, um, approaches for um, the guide. And much has been said about, you know, can we make it a living document? Um, you know, can, how are we going to keep this sort of alive so that we don't have this giant backlog after 14 or 15 years and trying to move things ahead? Um, you know, by a giant step. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about the Canadian Council on Animal Care and, and how um, in more recent years they've been approaching development of their guidelines. The CCAC was founded in 1968 and um, it develops principles, guidelines and policies as required resources for Canadian facilities that work with animals in science and education. It's overseen by a standards committee that is made up of the secretariat, but also scientists, veterinarians, um, administrators, and others um, from facilities, as well as um, animal um, public animal advocates. And there's broad um, public review of the guidance documents that are developed by them. Originally, the CCAC had a, had a two volume set of their guide for care and use of experimental animals one dealing with basic concepts and policies and the other one dealing with um, specific care and husbandry of, of specific species. But around two decades ago, they recognized that certain areas were moving forward at different paces and that it was very difficult and unwieldy to update the entire guide each time. And so um, conceptually, they've broken um, their guidance going forward into sort of specific guidelines on different um, topics like um, animal care programs, program management, um, and, and they've been able then to develop these different little guidelines um, for these different areas. And the compilation of these then must be followed by um, Canadian facilities that receive uh, federal funds or that import large animal species such as primates 
dogs or pigs into Canada for research. The CCAC also assesses Canadian research facilities to evaluate compliance with these resources that they produce. As was mentioned then, the guidelines are science informed and they're largely performance based. And these um, guidelines, principles and policies are reviewed at intervals. Smaller changes can be introduced by the standards committee without public review. So if there are little tweaks and things, updated references, those can be added. Um, and they produce implementation guidance, clarifications, and frequently asked questions to help support uptake of these resources. And um, this may be able to address maybe in part some of these questions about should the guide be a living document. They also, the CCAC Secretariat also maintains a rubric to prioritize update of the guidelines. So everything doesn't get updated at once. And it's sort of based on a review of the literature to see where the most information has come forward, where the highest impact will be. Um, species use is also comes into this and risk. Um, and that's how they make decisions about which, which guides to develop or guidance to develop and, and when to update different guides. Next slide, please. So just one example of this um, that I thought I'd provide is um, the update on carbon dioxide euthanasia procedures for rodents. Um, the original CCAC um, uh, guidelines on euthanasia using carbon dioxide were developed a number of years ago. After the AVMA um, published their guidelines for euthanasia in 2020, the CCAC took evidence from those guidelines and updated, tweaked um, their document overall and then published um, an implementation document with direct links to um, AVMA um, document in there um, to help assist programs then to um, update their practices. And so this particular example helped to allow for interim updates and clarifications. And this helps then to keep um, the um, guidance in line with updates and research. Um, this was discussed really at a committee level um, to make these changes. And again, one of the things that has been requested um, in surveys for um, the guide is to provide linked references that underpin the changes in guidance. And this is something um, that the CCAC has been able to do as well when they make their changes. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that I talked about is that the CCAC um, really uses performance-based approaches when they are producing guidelines. And an example of this is from the recent primate guidelines, which were published in 2019. Um, I put the link on this here, and Dr. Bloomsmith mentioned also this type of approach when thinking about how we are um, housing and caring for primates in research settings. This example here is from a, um, Table 1 from Appendix 1 of the CCAC guideline document, and it allows um, institutions that are working with primates then to think about the important components that are required really for good welfare of primates and allows them to score um, these different components um, to assess the quality and the adequacy of the housing um, being provided to those animals, uh, with the understanding that the housing system should be a, at least acceptable. So while the move is towards EU pen style housing, it's not necessarily required as long as the housing that's being provided can meet most of these other requirements um, uh, and, and animals can be managed appropriately. So this is just, again, an example of how the performance-based approach helps um, animal care and research programs move forward um, and improve aspects of welfare for the animals that they're caring for. Next slide, please. One of the things um, that is really important, of course, and was mentioned again by several people yesterday was um, really, it's really important in future editions of the guide to emphasize um, a focus on training for implementation of new requirements. And um, certainly um, I consider training and education to be essential components, even the backbone for improving our animal care and welfare programs. And one thing I found really interesting when thinking about um, EU Directive 2010-63 um, was um, when, when that directive came in, it had a very significant requirement um, because of the move to, to house animals in more extensive settings for behavioral management of large animal species, so primates, dogs, and pigs, in their appendix four. So not only was there this requirement um, to move to larger spaces, but then also this um, training so that we can manage animals better. And as part of that, then um, through their cost 
um, which uh, Academy, which is European cooperation in science and technology, which helps to develop um, skills and knowledge. Um, through this academy, they offered a series of free workshops across the EU over several years to support behavior management training of staff who are working with large animal species. So it can this recognizes it can be really difficult sometimes to move to these new areas and ways of managing animals and having a plan in place and supporting research institutions to move in these directions is really important. Okay, um, next slide, please. So moving, moving to some um, global trends in laboratory animal science um, that again, might be considered um, in future editions of the guide. I did wanna come back to this concept of the three R's and I wanna um, emphasize that the three R's was never an ethical concept. So the three R's are a key conceptual framework for guiding care of use of animals um, in science and education. And it's broadly promoted in laboratory animal science, so replacement, reduction, and refinement. The fundamental goal of these was to incorporate social concerns about animals into the design of animal research. So the three R's initially sought to weave together good science, good care, and socially acceptable practices of laboratory animal research. They were developed in 1959 as a concept, right, but not widely adopted until the 80s. And as can be seen with any process that has not been refreshed for a period of time, we can see some stagnation. So this has resulted in kind of a more passive approach that we see today and this loss of feeling maybe of individual responsibility and a sense of waiting for something external to happen to move lab animal science forward. So I hear comments such as if only the guide could be updated or if only our regulations could change, then we could really change things and do some good. But I think it's really important for us to think about empowering ourselves individually through our eye cooks, um, nationally and elsewhere, you know, through these very meaningful concepts. Next slide, please. So I think as we think about the guide, maybe updating our conceptualization of the three R's could be really important. And um, to reinvigorate the concept of the three R's, which um, is still an appropriate conceptual framework, the National Center for Three R's in the UK has updated the concepts to capitalize on emerging scientific developments and information. And um, they've really emphasized the active responsibility of the individuals and institutions working with animals to engage in the three R's. And so they've moved from sort of our standard definitions to, um, and I'll just read them here for replacement, accelerating in, uh, the development and use of tools and models to address scientific questions without the use of animals a primary goal, right? Reduction, appropriately designed and analyzed studies that are robust and reproducible and that truly contribute to knowledge base. And refinement, advancing animal welfare through use of latest in vivo technologies and improving our understanding of the impact of animal welfare and the lived experiences of animals on scientific outcomes. So I think, again, if we can update this, our concepts and thinking about it, these can be very engaging, um, um, framework still to use. Next slide, please. Um, inclusion of culture of care. So we've heard about this from a number of different speakers. This is based on care-based ethics, which we've seen emerging in human medicine since the 1980s, but also social work and veterinary medicine. Dr. Turner, you have a one yes. minute warning. Okay, thank you so much, I'm almost done. Um, through, um, um, through our uh, sorry, um, for the last couple of decades, but culture of care, I like this sort of more holistic definition here, institutional responsibility for an ongoing sustained process to ensure good animal care and welfare, good well-being for those caring for and working with animals. This recognizes the impact of working with animals on the people who care for them, but also excellence in research quality and data reproducibility and enhanced openness and societal transparency. So when we adopt a culture of care that succeeds a culture of compliance, it emphasizes care, respect, and responsibility. Next slide, please. Also, as mentioned by um, a couple of speakers today and emphasized yesterday, moving away from maybe separating different topics of housing and husbandry and um, moving towards this broader and more holistic concept of research animal behavioral management much of what we call enrichment in the current guide are really just basic provisions and necessities for animals. This applies to all species. And um, approaching this more holistically reflects consideration of needs of animals during their entire stay in the facility 
And this approach considers animals really as integral partners in our research process. Um, next slide. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Turner. Yes. We, and so yeah, if I can just mention, yeah. Um, so I've just summarized these here. Um, and then I provided a couple of references uh, or slides of references as well at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Our next speaker in this session is Dr. Burkowski from ALAC International, who will introduce himself. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bowerman. I realize I'm in a precarious position sitting between you and, and lunch, so I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Um, thank you to the workshop organizers for the invitation to present today. I recall yesterday, Dr. Bob Disco presented the evolution of the name from Ilar to Bosker, and I'd like to do a similar effort here for ALAC. So you can see here in 1965, ALAC was formed as the American Association for the Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care. <clears throat> Excuse me, in 1996, we updated our name to the Association for the Assessment and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care International. And then in 2016, our name was contemporized to remove the words associated with the letters. So the name of our organization since February of 2016 has been ALAC International. Next. You can keep going, thank you. Uh, I'm Gary Borkowski. I'm the CEO, Chief Executive Officer at ALAC International. I, uh, I'm a laboratory animal veterinarian board certified. I've worked in industry, academia, and government over my career. And today I'm presenting on how ALAC applies to guide uh, globally in our accreditation program next. Just a brief outline of, of the uh, summary of my slides today. I'll give a little bit of background and history. I've already started on that. I'll provide an overview of ALAC around the world a brief update on some of our current initiatives, and then a few recommendations for the uh, Standing Committee to consider. Thank you. Next slide. In 2022, ALAC adopted a new strategic plan, and two of the many outputs from that uh, strategic effort were a new mission statement and a new vision statement. Our mission statement is ALAC International improves the welfare of animals in science and education through the accreditation of organizations meeting high standards of humane and responsible animal care. And our new vision is a world where excellence in animal welfare and science converge. And you can see in the lower left of this slide, when this picture appears, that depicts a slide that has received ALAC endorsement. Thank you, next slide. <clears throat> so back to our history yesterday, Dr. Hickman mentioned uh, and I showed earlier that we were founded in 1965 in Illinois. And you can see here for our uh, nonprofit status and our articles of incorporation, the fundamental purpose of our organization is to improve the general welfare of animals produced for or used in research, testing, and educational programs, and to enhance the quality of these programs. And the latter part of that really speaks to part of our uh, initiatives to focus on and foster continuous improvement in animal care and use programs. Next slide. Yesterday, Dr. Hickman presented a nice overview of our, uh, in, of our references. So I'm not gonna go into that today, but I do wanna point you to this uh, audio enhanced PowerPoint presentation that uh, our Senior Director for North America and Dr. Helen Diggs produced. This is available on our website, and I would encourage you to, uh, to go to that if you have time or are interested. Next. So fundamentally, we base our accreditation, our program description on the guide, and that's reflected in our rules of accreditation, uh, which states in section two, the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals shall serve as a basic guide to the establishment of specific standards for accreditation. And so from here on, you'll see that because we have programs around the world, that in effect means that the guide is being utilized in the, in the countries I'll be listing here shortly. 
Next slide. So this is just a, a picture to help you try to understand how all of our documents and references that we use uh, work together. So I mentioned on the previous slide that the guide is the basis for our program description and our site visits. We also rely heavily on the regulations in the applicable country or region. That's also stated in our rules. And then we have a variety of other documents as depicted in the circle and that many of these were articulated uh, in Dr. Hickman's talk yesterday. Next. So one of the questions or points that came up uh, in the introduction of this session was, how does funding affect our programs and our, the accreditation? And we use institutional animal ownership to determine which animals are included. And we expect all animals owned by the applicant or accredited unit be included in the program description and to be assessed and, and reviewed by the ALAC International Site Visit Team. Next. So just a summary slide uh, reminding you or informing you of some of the basis of our organization. We're a nonprofit organization. I, I referred to our articles of incorporation. Uh, we're non-governmental and we typically don't establish standards or policies. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that as we're trying to uh, fill gaps, if you will. And so we we are an organization that assesses and accredits programs around the world that use animals in science and education. Next. Just allow me a minute or two to talk about our organization. We're based uh, upon several different components. The first one is our member organizations referred to, referred to as MOs. You can see some examples here of of organizations around the world that are members of, of ALAC. Uh, you can go to the next bullet. And the member organizations meet annually. They elect the board of directors as one of their many duties. And you can see here, the board of directors is comprised of 12 delegates from the MOs as officers and directors, as well as the president and vice president of council on accreditation are also members of the board. Next. Uh, we have three offices around the world. Our headquarters is in Frederick, Maryland. We have Dr. Javier Guillen based in Pamplona, Spain, Senior Director for Latin America, Europe and Latin America, and Dr. Montip Jedi Akaman, uh, Senior Director for Southeast Asia is based in Bangkok, Thailand. Next. And, and importantly, we are very blessed to have over 500 hardworking, dedicated volunteers comprised of over 60 council members from over six or from 16 countries and regions around the world, 41 council member emeriti, and over 400 ad hoc representatives supporting the site visit process. Next. Uh, this was referenced in Dr. Hickman's talk. So not only the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals, but we also I uh, use the guide for ag animals as well as the Council of Europe ETS 123. Next. So you can build this slide. Uh, I'm not going to read all these various countries listed. You can see here the name of the country and then in parentheses the year that the first program was an, accredited in that country. Next. But wait, there's more. So that list that you just saw there very quickly, 50 countries and regions around the world where again, ALAC is, is accrediting animal care and use programs. Uh, on the previous slide, there was an asterisk, asterisk next to Qatar. And that is just because that program is part of a, uh, a program based in the US. Next slide. So how does the accreditation around the world break down? You can see here in this pie chart that about a tenth of the programs are based in Europe. About a quarter of the programs are based in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, just a little less than two thirds are in North America and the remainder are in Latin America, Africa and the Middle East. Next. This was uh, mentioned last uh, yesterday by Dr. Fox and Dr. Turner just shared some examples of the translation of the guide 
into different languages, and you can see those examples here as well. Thanks. Next slide. So I'm not going to present a lot of references for the committee to consider. This is a recent one, and I'm presenting this because I know this is a topic that's received a lot of attention. So I just want to put this on the committee's uh, radar. The name of the article is Mission Accomplished with a Question Mark, a European Cross-National Comparative Study on the Integration of the Harm-Benefit Analysis into Law and Policy Documents. Next. And the authors of this article conclude that there are deficits in the transposition of the HBA requirements into national laws. Additionally, significant discrepancies in available policy documents relating to HBA. And finally, insufficiently consistent implementation of HBA in European countries. So again, just one reference for the committee to consider in your deliberations. Next. So just a, a bit of an update on some of the activities uh, within our office and across council. This is a representative of a committee and subcommittees, one more effort uh, initiative out of, of our 2022 strategic plan. So we have a committee on accreditation standards. This committee is chaired by Dr. Trish Foley, the president of the Council on Accreditation. And you can see there's five uh, subcommittees, the culture of care, which we've heard about uh, recently in Dr. Turner's talk and others. We have a subcommittee on veterinary care, a subcommittee on the three R's, another one on housing conditions, and finally a subcommittee reviewing reference resources. And these committees are looking to fill some gaps that were identified because of the delay and or the length of time between the last version of the guide and so you will be seeing in the coming weeks and months draft position statements for one or more of these topics. And when those are published for public comment, we encourage you to read them and send back any comments you have to, to ALAC. Next. So I just want to share a couple slides to really highlight how much pride and uh, energy people put into preparing for and celebrating when they achieve ALAC accreditation. The, the photo on the upper left is a recent image from an article I found on the web, web page that uh, shows an institution that was recently accredited and they're probably displaying their newly uh, sent uh, ALAC accreditation plaque. And then on the lower right, you can see an institution that is uh, welcoming the ALAC International Site Visit team to their site for their site visit. Uh, next slide. So in case you couldn't see the plaque in the previous slide, I wanted to give you just a representative example of, of what they were proudly displaying. This is just an example. That's not the image from the previous slide. You can go to the next slide. Here you can see an alternate view of how programs may view achieving and uh, obtaining and achieving and, and maintaining accreditation, uh, courtesy of Anthony James. And if you look closely at the various triangles within this uh, pyramid here, you can see many chapters and sections of the guide that exist uh, to, again, further the importance of how the guide is used around the world. Next. So uh, starting to wrap up here, uh, in my view, it's a delicate balancing act that ALAC, uh, all the volunteers, the staff, the accredited programs are working to achieve uh, focusing on high quality animal care and welfare, while importantly promoting and ensuring reproducible science and in vivo education. Next. So yesterday I heard uh, Dr. Pritchett Corning have an adverse reaction to uh, artificial intelligence. And I am kind of like you, Kate, I uh, prefer real intelligence over artificial intelligence. So I just asked ChatGTP one question. Uh, Dr. Dowie Rollins, our uh, council vice president, introduced me to ChatGTP. So I asked 
what is the optimal cage size for laboratory rats, mice, dogs, and non-human primates? Next, and chat GTP answered in part, it's important for researchers and animal care staff to consider not only the physical dimensions of the cage, but also factors such as environmental enrichment, social housing, and opportunities for natural behaviors when determining the optimal cage size for laboratory animals. Additionally, local regulations and institutional guidelines may dictate specific requirement housing for housing laboratory animals. So to me, this is a, a good summary of some of the points I brought up, as well as some of the, the previous speakers and likely speakers uh, the rest of today. Next. So in conclusion, I would just like to ensure the committee that in, in my opinion, the guide framework is time honored and accreditation proven. And I also believe that updates at this time are appropriate and should be timely. I would uh, ask the committee to consider a 10 year cycle for periodic review and update. And based upon the phasing I saw Dr. Fox present yesterday, I think a 10 year cycle is likely the minimum amount of time it's gonna take anyway. And finally, I would encourage the committee to continue to support a global performance-based approach that includes the framework for musts and shoulds. And last slide, uh, Dr. Fox mentioned yesterday in his last slide, Back to the Future. Here's my version. If you remember from that movie, uh, uh, it uh, the, the DeLorean needed to get up to 88 miles per hour to go back to the future. Here is my new electric vehicle. It's a Rivian, as you can see. I named her Rosie after the robot in the TV series, The Jetsons, and it takes Rosie about four seconds to get me up to 88 miles per hour. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burkowski. I'm now going to turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Lofgren. Uh, thank you both for your incredible talks today. I think you've um, provided us a nice picture of what the global landscape is um, and where the guide can best participate in that in that growth and space. Um, so we did have a couple questions. The first one I was going to start with um, um, for both of you is that there's increasing data to support some refinements, such as non-aversive handling in rodents and vertical flight in non-human primates. And these are already being incorporated into regulatory frameworks in other geographies. What do you see as the guide's opportunity in aligning with these evidence-based refinements expectations, and what is the risk for not aligning with them? Can I, Gary, do you want me to start on that maybe? Um, I, I think I had provided an example of um, how things can move ahead without, um, without perhaps um, a framework such as the guide to help support it through um, Marseille Declaration, for example. And um, so there is a risk in, in not having um, supportive guidance for, um, um, these sorts of policies related to vertical flight, um, non-aversive handling of rodents, and many, many other different areas, actually. But again, I think many speakers have emphasized, and our speakers this morning in the um, behavior management section also talked about um, performance-based approach to make some of these changes. These are hard. Um, there is enormous capital expenditure for large facilities in making some of these changes that are needed. And um, being able to support institutions as they make steps towards um, um, improving aspects of housing and, and handling um, is really important. So again, that flexibility performance-based approach is, is really important. Thank you, Thanks. Pat. I would uh, totally agree with all those comments and just re reflect back on the uh, slide I showed where it's a balancing act, as well as the point that from an accreditation perspective, we uh, would refer to the, the regulations in those countries. So if there was a regulation that exceeded the guide that would be expected to be uh, followed for our accreditation program. And finally, uh, I view the the work as a partnership and that, as you saw, the council is working on trying to uh, supplement some of the information 
that maybe the guide hasn't been able to uh, contemporize in, in their document. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we had another good question come up, um, and this is specifically for Dr. Turner. So the model of keeping up with CCAC um, updated, which is updated in a more timely manner, sounds really helpful. Um, have any of the stakeholders there experienced any downsides as a result of taking on that current practice? Well, as always, change management is it's very difficult uh, in facilities and um, involves a lot of training and education of people in addition to sometimes um, resources for equipment and other things. So um, typically, um, as was done for the last edition of the guide, um, typically there's a timeline also provided for implementation. So um, this, you know, it might be um, something, for example, for housing, it might be 25% in two years, 50% in four years, you know, et cetera. So that allows facilities to um, be able to start to move and demonstrate progress without having to do it all at once. And um, that's been similar for other guidelines as well. There's a timeline, um, you know, um, a, a real push to develop education and training materials to help support that workshops and other things that are presented. Thank you very much. So it sounds like um, we heard some feedback yesterday that phased approaches that are supported um, can help institutions adjust to those kinds of changes. So if we did have a more agile format, it sounds like that would be very valuable. Right. Excellent. Recognizing grant cycles are five years often. And, you know, um, so, you know, we have to be, again, um, especially when it involves large capital expenditures, we have to be really um, thinking about these things and giving stakeholders a lot of notice for implementation. Absolutely. And so you've mentioned, you know, capital um, that would need to be invested in, say, um, adaptations of housing. We've also had a lot of discussions this morning around performance manage um, performance based standards, and especially around behavioral management. If we're applying performance based standards in that space, we need individuals who are appropriately trained and have the expertise to be able to design those, implement them, and then monitor them to make sure they're effective. Um, we heard some suggestions this morning around roles that could be um, key parts of an institutional care and use program to support those kinds of uh, performance based approaches. What are your thoughts on um, more clearly <laughs> clearly defining roles that would be important for supporting performance-based um, standards when it comes to behavioral management. I'm assuming, Gary, I should tackle this one, but um, um, certainly um, where, uh, where human resources are available and can be supported, having behaviorists or even behavior champions, people who are interested in aspects that um, are participating in various workshops, gaining information that then they can um, use to provide training in their facility. There are so many resources that are available and with sort of increased um, ability to have um, workshops and other seminars and webinars um, electronically. It's really improved people's access to, um, to having these. So um, having, having that focus on behavior, but also training IACUC and welfare assessment, having um, that as a general component, uh, a regular welfare assessment of, of species that are in facilities can also really help um, to um, support change and um, support some of these new newer concepts um, in programs. Thank you. Gary, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I, no, I don't. I think that's all uh, appropriate as we learn more about the needs of the animals and the ability to support those needs. Okay, thank you. We have one more question coming over. Just a second. Let's see. Is this the one about updating the CCA updates? Let's see. 
Okay, yes, it's sort of a related question um, to our earlier question around the more agile model that the CCAC has adopted in terms of providing more timely updates through committee work. Um, so another comment around that and a question uh, for Dr. Turner. I really like the idea about using CCAC updates being done in smaller chunks and based on current literature. What is the expected timeline for those Canadian institutions to implement those changes? Right. So again, it will, uh, I, I want to emphasize that I'm not speaking on behalf of the CCAC, but um, um, as someone, you know, who has uh, conducted assessments and um, sat on their committees and other things, but it really, um, implementation really depends on the guidance document and the uh, breadth of, of change that will be um, expected. For certain things like the CO2 guidance, um, there is no reason for facilities not to take that up almost immediately. And so there is a very short sort of window uh, and expectation for changing SOPs and training um, investigators and others um, to uh, ensure that they were following the new guidance. For other things um, such as housing, that's a 10 year phase in, for example, for many of the species, because again of the um, capital expenditure um, and impact on institutions. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, I think one last speaker and relative to the use and um, of the guide in a global framework, um, different global regulatory frameworks address the roles and requirements of veterinarians that provide clinical care for animals needed for research. In some cases, no attending veterinarian is required or the potential um, of conflict of interest is not considered. For example, a research veterinarian can also be responsible for the clinical care of animals on their study. Even though this is less of a concern in the U.S., do you see value in clarifying the roles and requirements of clinical veterinarians in the guide to help meet that gap in the international space? I, I can start if you want, Pat. So I mentioned the uh, Committee on Accreditation Standards and one of the subcommittees is veterinary care. So for accredited programs, you uh, we already have a position statement on the attending veterinarian and veterinary care. And that subcommittee is has done a lot of work to revise that position statement that will be going out for public comment soon. And some of the concerns or comments you brought up, Jennifer, are being uh, fortified in that document. So that's how accredited programs would be um, you know, informed and, and expected to manage those uh, concerns. Excellent. I think that's a good example of where we might not have specifications in the guide, but other groups are leaning in to meet that gap um, and maybe highlights additional opportunities for the guide if um, the field is seeing a need for clarification in those spaces. Excellent. Any additional questions from the committee? I don't think we have any other more coming in through Slido. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your expertise today. We really appreciate it. We're actually going to break for lunch now and we'll be back at 12, 10 p.m. Eastern time. So you have about 30 minutes for lunch and then we'll return with session six, emerging issues for the guide. Thank you.